Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming back from break on this beautiful day. Um, my name is Jennifer Wiley. I work at Jensen Hughes. Um, I've been working there for about nine years on various types of modeling, including fire modeling um, and egress heat transfer. But today I'm specifically going to uh, focus on egress modeling. Uh, we've seen a lot of um, presentations throughout these past couple days on various forms of egress modeling, and I'm going to kind of take a step back from that and look at some of the, what I'm going to call non-traditional uses of, of egress modeling, places where um, they're emerging as, as new, new issues to look at and, and to take advantage of the egress models that we already have. So I'm going to go over some background briefly, um, the current capabilities of the model, and then just look at several examples of, of some of these uh, non-traditional uses. So I think, um, especially after the past couple of days, most of you are familiar with the ba basic capabilities of, of the current models. Um, but just briefly, what I want to focus on is that most of these models are, have been developed with the idea of evacuating buildings, particularly in the case of fire. So in the past couple years, I've seen as in, in my business with consulting, our clients are getting more and more interested in using these models for, for non-evacuation purposes or for evacuation modeling that's not a typical fire emergency. The benefit of that is, of course, that we can leverage these models in some cases that have already built, been built for egress for other purposes and get additional use out of the model, additional value to the client, and, and provide a lot of good feedback for, for them on their normal operations or, or special um, conditions. <coughs> So again, since most of you are familiar with this, I'm just going to briefly cover typical evacuation analysis, which we'll start with building the geometry. As some of you are probably familiar, that is often the bulk of the work, especially as we have um, larger and larger buildings and facilities. Um, you, you populate the model. I'm, I'm mostly focusing here on agent-based models. Um, but you, So you would populate the model based on certain assumptions that you have for your building. Your, po your occupants would have various characteristics. And then you, you press play. Um, and your occupants proceed in an orderly manner to the exits. Um, sometimes you can program, depending on your goals, you'll program intermediate tasks or behaviors, but that's the basic way that one of these models would generally proceed. And of course, I'm grossly oversimplifying here. Um, but in general, the primary focus has been to exit. Um, now we're starting to look at, well, what happens when you want to use the model differently? Maybe you don't want to exit. Maybe you want to enter. Maybe in the case of horizontal, um, horizontal exiting, you want to exit, but to a different compartment. So you don't really want to completely leave the building. You still want to keep track of people on the other side of that door. Um, also, occupants, the... Um, general limits of these models, and it's, I recognize that this is just, you know, sometimes just a computational limit, is that there's some level of omniscience that your occupants are generally assumed to have. Uh, you know, a typical occupant will be aware of all the possible routes. They'll be aware of the shortest route. Um, they'll know somehow that that door is locked down the, down the road. Now, there are, there are ways to overcome that. You can, in some cases, you can give uh, occupants familiarity with exits and that sort of thing. But it is a, somewhat of a limitation that we're starting to look at and see the best way to address that kind of issue. So that brief overview, I'm just going to jump into um, several of the the kind of new and non-traditional uses that we've started to, to use. Um, the first one is ingress and security. 
So a number of facilities or buildings with entrance procedures have come to us recently because they're looking to optimize and or characterize the ingress into their buildings. This is especially true for, for things like um, stadiums, arenas, and uh, government buildings where they have security procedures to get in, as well as things like airports. What we have found is that the existing models are for the most part very well suited to basically reverse that flow, to have people go into a building rather than out of the building. Um, the people, these, these models can be used to um, do things like determine the maximum arrival rate. So how many people can come per minute before we really start having problems with congestion. We can determine what, what factors in the design are limiting and potentially use that to, um, to tweak or, or adjust the design and really improve the day-to-day -day operations. So I'm just going to give a, a brief uh, few case studies. The first one is a simple ingress into a high-rise um, high building. So the basic flow that you're looking at here is um, occupants enter from the street. They go into this small lobby and through, the, um, through some turnstiles where they have to scan their badge. And then finally, they wait up around here for the elevators. So this is just one example of many that we run of, of what that might look like. The, the types of things that we varied were the arrival rate, the, um, the turnaround speed of the elevators, the scan rate of the, the, the flow through of the, um, the turnstiles. And with all of that, we were able to get some, some good insights to pass along to the, the building operator that said, hey, look, in your current configuration, you're going to get most likely a lot of congestion, not at the turnstiles, which is what you might think, but waiting to get on the elevator. So the other... Um, advice that we were able to get was to look at and say, this is not too much of a problem up to, I believe it was 50 per people per minute approaching. That said, what we did was we said, well, if you can move your turnstiles, if you can change your arrangement of the building just slightly, you can basically give more space to your, to your people using the elevators. It's not really going to speed up their ingress in terms of um, the actual time that they leave unless you change your elevator operation. But it will give them a little more space. It might make them slightly less cranky on a Monday morning um, and just improve the overall flow. So that was a really, relatively simple um, ingress analysis. We have done much more complex analysis where um, we looked at a ingress into a building where the security procedures were much more um, complicated. They had a revolving door where you scan a badge, and there was also a means to what they call it kickback to prevent piggybacking, so to prevent two people from going in through the door with one scan of the badge. Fortunately, we were able to go out to both the existing building that they were looking to install these new scanners in and get um, information on in, you know, arrival rates, which turned out to be very important because due to the proximity of this building to public transport, both the subway and the bus, we found that the arrival rates were not constant and there were often rush um, bursts that played a significant role in the, the congestion that we saw. The second thing that we were able to do that we found very significant was to go out to another site and look at the equipment itself and see it being used on site by real people and measure um, flow rates. And the, the big thing that, that came out of that analysis was that the cards often misread and the kickback 
led to a much slower flow rate than the flow rate that the manufacturer had given. So if this study had been done without that additional information, the bursts and the, the, man, the actual real thro throughput, we would have found a much smoother process. It, as a point of fact, when we actually modeled this, um, we found that during peak rush hour, you could get potentially 20 minute delays to enter the building, which this particular building was not going to happen. Um, it was not going to be to uh, be acceptable. So the ultimate recommendation here was that they purchased more, purchased more scanners and uh, improved that flow. So again, this is um, a new use. The, these models do, like I said, work relatively well out of, right out of the box. Um, there are some clever tweaks right now in the models that you, you do have to do to, to, to simulate this behavior. Um, some potential changes that might make this a little bit more organic to model would be to um, add things like ticket gate um, Capabilities. I know some models have these, some some don't, with a fixed delay, occupant source terms, and then again, ultimately, our final goal was not going to be an exit. The next example would be dynamic signage. Um, right now, I think most of you realize that we're we've gotten really good at putting exit signs everywhere, so good that you almost don't see them. Um, they've become visual clutter. So in the case of an emergency, it's, it's common to have somebody walk right by a door that's well marked because they don't, they're not really looking for, they don't see the signs. So there's been um, studies that have been done to, to improve the signage, to make it dynamic, to make it more attracted, more attention during emergencies, and also to, to provide some information rather than just having a, a static sign. Um, so some of the work that Professor Galea has done um, to, to develop and test these types of systems um, can provide active wayfinding and um, adjust and move people away from hazards, hazardous situations. So um, we, we started to look at how the models themselves can actually, can actually incorporate that. Um, in order to do that, we have to have a model that is, um, if we're talking about an intelligent system where the, the computer itself does the determination and the routing, there has to be, the model needs to run faster than real time in order to make that um, decision. And there has to be a way to um, transfer that data back and forth. You also have to have, um, um, in the case where you want to have your system be manually guided, but depending on the, the building operators, then you need, then the model can be used to um, provide input so they know that given X, probably the best approach would be Y. So. The end result of this, hopefully, is that um, we can use our models to create a more optimized result. We can limit the backtracking, we can reduce counterflow, and hopefully provide a safer environment. Um, just to touch on existing model implementation, um, I know that there are some models that have signage in a, in a limited um, capacity. Um, for the most part, the models that I'm familiar with, you can do this. It's a very manual process in order of, in order to uh, tell somebody to go somewhere and turn around. It, it requires a lot of its um, direction, and it also tends to be more deterministic because of that. Because you have you have to say, well, this person here is going to go to this exit and then turn around, or vice versa. Versus having um, the the model decide how, how people are going to move. So in order to, to improve that, some of the future work that we might want to look at is having um, the agents within the model receive information from, um, from signage, from direct observation, so walking up to a door, see, shaking the handle and turning around, and potentially um, even 
and more advanced cases, having other occupants tell them. You know, the occupant that's already turned around saying, hey, that door's closed, go this way. So the last one I'll get into is, is assisted evacuation. I think we've um, heard a lot of good information about that this past couple days. Um, most of these models, or the, the current models, um, consider individual behavior, or some, sometimes there are groups, but it's usually individual movement towards an exit. Um, the only good way currently that we have to account for the mobility impaired is we can, of course, decrease their speed. But there's no good way to um, account for mobility aids such as wheelchairs, walkers, crutches, or in the case of evac a hospital evacuation, beds or stretchers. So in practice, we all know that we've got complex um, complex itineraries, varying speeds depending on whether you're assisting a person or not. Um, increased counterflow can be significant where you've got large equipment passing back and forth within a, within a corridor. Um, people move differently when they're using wheelchairs or walkers. And, and finally, again, we're not having people go to an exit necessarily. We might be having people go to an area of refuge or even just to the next corridor over. Somewhat related to that, and, and Eva uh, alluded to this earlier, is um, carrying behavior. Um, in that when you are carrying large objects or pushing or pulling, for example, rolling luggage, um, that affects your shape, it affects the way you move, and um, we found that this can play a big role in, in our results. So the example that we give, um, and this was presented, I believe, at last year's PED conference, was that we did a, a review at a large international airport where we found that the presence of occupants using rolling, um, rolling luggage reduced the flow through, the, um, through doorways by about a third. So that really comes into play. Right now, we've attempted to um, address that by doing things like increasing the shoulder width of occupants, but that doesn't fully capture the, the actual shape profile of somebody carrying luggage or pushing a bed. Again, some models do have a group feature that could be adapted. Um, the potential issue that when I've been looking into this that is I've seen is that um, it's not practical for multiple trips because often the group feature is still designed to just exit versus having, for example, a staff member go back and forth and, and basically have multiple groups. Um, and again, in case of internal relocation, your final goal is not necessarily an exit. You might really just be going to the next corridor over Right now, the existing state of the models, and I understand that this is changing, especially, you know, particularly for, for Pathfinder, but you kind of have to trick the model into getting people to stay in a corridor versus trying to um, immediately exit. It is possible. I'll skip that for now. And um, so, again, You'll see later on how, how this assisted evacuation will be coming into play in, in Pathfinder, but I think we're um, doing, developing some really cool uses for the, for the model, and hopefully we can improve on those in the future. So, any questions? Questions for the speaker? couple of remarks uh, more than questions. Interesting presentation. Uh, first thing, uh, be very careful with the statement that uh, of who was born before between evacuation models and pedestrian models because it depends on which conference you go, you will hear people <laughs> saying different things. So, I mean, some of the models that are implemented in evacuation simulators are, have been used before for pedestrian dynamics or for computer graphics like uh, the ones that Pathfinder use. So, it's a bit controversial, but I know some people argue one thing and the other thing. Uh, the second thing is um, some of the features that you mentioned somehow 
are implemented in some of the models, uh, and I know you guys are doing an effort for this, other model developers do. But the question is, to, to my opinion, not just the implementation of the feature, because this is relatively easy, probably. <laughs> you would disagree <laughs> with me. <laughs> but it's how to validate these models, right. because for instance, group behaviors, there are a couple of examples of uh, some models uh, here and there, but how to really validate this really relies on the type of experiments that guys like us do. So, I mean, it's good to bring up these things, and it's, it's very interesting that many of the concepts that you're presenting overlap with what I was saying, and we didn't talk to each other. <laughs> so that's, that's quite good. But I want you to comment on the fact that a feature itself without uh, backup from validation, uh, how useful can it be for a consultant? Uh... Right, and I agree that we, we still have to, um, to validate any kind of use that we wanted to use. That's why we were, um, we were fortunate to be able to do that for the ingress portion of this. Um, and I, I try to be as general as possible in terms of the, ca the capabilities of, of various egress models, but I know there are a lot out there. So um, I do think it's important uh, absolutely to, to do the validation. And as, as kind of the increasing capabilities start to come online, um, hopefully we can, can be able to have or generate the, the data to do that. Anyone else? Questions? No? No? Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff.